So hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Isinga, and I'm the new manager of patient programs, research and advocacy here at Lymphoma Canada. And thank you for all attending the second educational session of the day on challenges and inequalities of accessing lymphoma and CLL treatments in Canada. Um, now, before we start today's presentation, I just want to remind you that this session is being recorded and the recording will become available after the conference. You'll get an email when this happens. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we'll leave a few minutes for your questions, which you can type into the questions box at any point during the con conversation um, in the middle of the black toolbar at the bottom of your screen. So now I'd like to introduce and welcome our speaker, Dr. John Cravilla. Dr. Cravilla is a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and a hematologist in the Division of Medical Oncology and Hematology at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. He's a member of the Lymphoma Autologous Transplant and Immune Effector Cell Therapy Programs and the co-director of Beyond Ther Chemotherapy Program. Dr. Carrilla's research interest is the development of novel therapeutics in lymphoid malignancies and incorporating translational research into clinical trials. He's a lymphoma co-chair for the Cancer Canadian Cancer Trials Group, as well as the chair of our scientific group advisory board at Lymphoma Canada. Thank you very much for joining us today. But now you can start your presentation whenever you're ready. Okay, well, thanks, Sarah. So uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here and we should be ready to go. Uh, so as you, met, as you already heard, our, our topic today is looking at the inequalities and challenges in Canada in terms of treatment access with really a focus on uh, lymphoma and CLL. Um, here are our objectives looking at this in terms of the challenges in access to therapy. We're going to discuss some of the factors that are key contributors to access. Uh, a little bit of a summary about how drugs are approved and funded, but that really isn't going to be the focus. And then I'll show you some of the examples of drug access in Canada that I think really highlight where we are. Uh, also, by way of, uh, a, I think, a disclosure, so I've worked with multiple companies, as you heard in my introduction. Uh, we're very interested in pursuing uh, drug development in lymphoma. Uh, I'll also say uh, you heard there that I uh, co-direct a program at Princess Margaret called Beyond Chemotherapy, which is designed to accelerate the delivery of novel therapy to patients. And so I guess that's a bit of a conflict because it means I believe in novel therapy and I want to be able to try to access it uh, for patients uh, quickly, whether that's in my own center or across the country. Now to start, it's important to recognize that when we think about uh, how we look at, at treatments and their application, the data is really what drives what happens uh, with new drugs. And so in the next few slides, we're gonna pursue this a little bit further. Uh, you know, so those of you that have seen presentations looking at drug development and clinical trials are gonna be familiar with these concepts. And so, the typical drug development pathway traditionally followed these steps of clinical trials, a phase one uh, where a, a drug might be the first time it's being used in a human. The goal is really to identify the appropriate dose of this drug, to look a little bit at safety and understand that, uh, identify the recommended dose to move forward, understanding the safety characteristics there, and ideally get at least a preliminary sense of if the drug is effective, and potentially, uh, you know, maybe how effective it is. Looking at the, the next step of phase two clinical trial, this is where you look at a discrete patient population, and that might be as an example, second line treatment for patients with diffuse large cell lymphoma. And you're really trying to understand how effective the drug is. And with that, you'll also get a, a better understanding of that safety signal that you saw in the first uh, type of study you did, uh, again, in a, in a more specific patient population. And so you'll understand that a little bit better, but really here you're trying to understand uh, how well the drug works. And then if a drug succeeds in phase one and phase two, then a phase three clinical trial is, is really trying to take that drug to the next level. And can you demonstrate superior effectiveness over what a gold standard might be in that specific patient population that you want to look at? Now, what we've seen in the past 10 to 20 years is that there has been a shift in terms of how traditional drug development used to be 
and what we see now with modern drug development paradigms. The lesson was that it can take a very, very long time to see a drug you know, go through that process from a phase one to a phase three clinical trial and ultimately be approved. <clears throat> and this doesn't even take into account the preclinical work that may need to happen in a lab uh, you know, from the bench, bringing something to bedside to really lead to that change. One of the mechanisms that eventually came into place was this idea of accelerated approval. And so if drugs looked very good in an early phase study, uh, and looked safe and looked much more effective than what a previous standard was, in that setting, that type of study could lead to the approval or funding of a drug in a very specific circumstance. And that may be a bit of a risk for a payer or a funder because you don't understand, uh, you know, perhaps how well this performs against a standard treatment, but it's a way to at least make the drug av available to patients. And so in that setting, this may be uh, you know, in patients that have had multiple treatments where there aren't good options, it's a very high risk disease setting. And thus, this is where uh, these trials might make a big difference by uh, accelerating bringing a drug to a patient. Now, what you see frequently with clinical trials today is that there's been a shading of phase one and phase two, and that they often answer the same question within the same clinical trial, an early phase study. And what that allows someone to do is not have to wait until you get the answers from a phase one, I'm gonna write a new phase two study, do a phase two study separately. It slows down that administration. So can you speed up the administrative stuff that happens in the background in order to uh, make this available more quickly in the research setting to patients? And so this definitely can speed up the pace of development, um, there isn't too big a concern with safety because you'll be able to look at understanding the safety as you've been doing the clinical trial. Where it may be more of a concern is that if you've sped up this process and maybe the what you think of the phase two component is done in the context of one of these blended phase one, phase two studies, is that you know the efficacy readout looking at uh, whatever that may be, what proportion of patients respond to the treatment or how, how long they stay in remission, et cetera. So that look may not be with as many patients or with that traditional model. And so that may also uh, influence the confidence in understanding how effective the drug is. And why is this all important? Because when you look at the, the reminder here, what do we look at in clinical trials? Uh, these are the common endpoints people measure. And so the gold standard historically has been one, you know, that's an obvious one, overall survival. How long do people live when they're getting the drug? And there's no debate there. It's really easy to measure, is someone alive or dead? And you can follow them for a certain period of time and you know your answer. But that's also sometimes in lymphoma and other cancers, it may be a difficult endpoint to look at because it may take many years to happen, particularly in, a, in the primary treatment setting where we have very good outcomes. Looking at progression-free survival, so this is the proportion of people that are alive and in remission, and this is generally the endpoint that has become very consistent for the approval of a drug in a phase three study. And this, uh, again, is a good value because being alive and in remission, you might argue, is just as important as being alive, but this also adds that layer that the cancer is controlled, and being alive and in remission, and if that continues forever, that's a good measure of cure. This other term, event-free survival, incorporates additional endpoints, and it could include things like toxicity. It could include things like not responding to treatment, which PFS doesn't capture. And so it's, it's often an endpoint that also gets used quite frequently in clinical trials. <clears throat> what you may see with phase two studies is that a response endpoint, so a complete response, can, can you make a CT scan look normal or can you make a PET scan look normal? or overall response rate where you wanna see things improve by at least 50% on a CT scan, or if it's a PET scan, you wanna see things be less bright or you know, have a Doval score of uh, four as opposed to five. Um, you know, does this imaging get better? That's a good question. And for many phase two studies, and certainly for phase one, when you're looking at preliminary efficacy, these are the types of endpoints that are more traditionally looked at. And lastly, but you know, very importantly, quality of life as well as toxicity uh, 
frequently gets measured, certainly from a safety standpoint, but it might be really important to look at quality of life in the context of these types of clinical trials. And when you try to put all of this together, if you're designing studies like we do, the ideal endpoint is something that you don't want to have to wait 20 years to get an answer and should be very important in the con context of the disease. And we have to be careful when you look at lymphoma, there are many different kinds of lymphoma. So a disease where you're thinking about treating patients that are you know, maybe about to start their first treatment. So in large cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma and CLL, we know the for most patients, the outcomes are gonna be really good. And so it can take a really long time to look. And so it, it might be more useful to have uh, endpoints that happen in a, a more rapid period of time. And increasingly we're looking more and more at surrogates. The thing we all struggle with though is how do these reflect what we, what we want to accomplish, which is ultimately, can we cure more patients? And just to raise the idea here, all of these in a way are surrogates of that idea and maybe surrogates even of overall survival, which is something that again, when Health Canada or a payer looks at the data, these are the sorts of things they're thinking about. Now, getting onto that topic, what do the regulator and the payer tend to care about? Well, you know, obviously safety is going to be a key point and you're not going to see a drug approved if it has major safety concerns. What we know about most drugs is that they're going to have some side effects and some toxicities. Are those manageable? Are they severe? And if they don't, you know, cause frequently deaths or rarely deaths, ideally no deaths. And if these are uh, toxicities that can be managed safely and predictably, that's not going to be a big issue. From an efficacy standpoint, again, it's tr it's again, this is the challenge. How much better is this than something we already have? If it's been compared head to head, it's a lot easier to tell. If it's been a single arm study where you just have the effect of the drug and you don't have something to compare it, it's, uh, compare it against, you have to start to compare against historical controls. And so how do we do that? That's also can be quite a challenge when you're starting to think about these things. And so how do you think about that? You may be making comparisons with historical data. Lastly, looking at cost effectiveness, how much does the drug cost in terms of what you get? And that introduces this concept of cost per quality adjusted life years. So the time that people are in remission, how do they feel? That's the quality of life part of quality adjusted life years. How much did the drug cost to get you what you got in terms of a standard treatment? And the idea there is that's really a trying to apply some sort of value to what we're doing, okay? And the tough thing there is these are all somewhat arbitrary calls or decisions because people are placing uh, a value of dollars that they think are worth that quality, ad quality adjusted life year benefit. And this is something that uh, health, health economists and payers spend a lot of time thinking about. Now, if a study is negative, there's not a lot to talk about. And so if it's a, a trial that doesn't uh, work, show that the drug works very well, or if it doesn't beat a standard, it doesn't matter. But if a trial is positive, what happens next? So firstly, these are generally drugs that are made by pharma companies, and these are studies that have been done by pharma companies. And if the trial is positive, it was done with the idea that the pharma company wants to act on that data. But that question may be, is that company going to bring the drug into the country? And like a business, this is a commercial question. And the factors that go into that, what are the likelihood it's going to be approved? Is it going to be funded? And how big is the market? And so, you know, Canada is not a particularly small market at our population size, but we're not a large market. We're not like the US at you know, over 300 million people. We're about a 10th of that. But we're also not 3 million people and we're also a developed country. And so we have money, but we don't tend to pay for everything the way that may happen in, in the US. And so this leads to some of the challenges in terms of looking at this. And you know, the equation, how this gets sorted out, drugs get reviewed in a formal process both from a safety standpoint by Health Canada, and as well ultimately for this cost and what it means uh, from an efficacy standpoint to a patient. And if a drug isn't funded uh, by, by the government as a primary payer, and, and in Canada, it will be by a provincial government because that's how our healthcare system works, drugs may still be able to be accessed 
uh, in the private setting if you have health insurance or you can pay out of pocket or potentially through a patient assistance program. And these circumstances may be very different based on the cost of the drug and that cost per quality adjusted life year argument, because again, that value is really ultimately in the eye of the payer. It's not necessarily in the eye of the clinician or the eye of the patient. The gaps, well, the gaps come up in multiple places. So as an example, the data may be available, but the therapy isn't available in Canada. And so where does that come up? So if the data is presented at a big meeting, like at the American Society for Hematology meeting, which occurs every December, we'll see it there and we'll say, whoa, that's really exciting. That should change practice. But then, you know, when does it get uh, presented in a manuscript where you can see all of the details and be able to, to look at it and dissect it in more detail? Often those manuscripts come fairly soon thereafter. The challenge then is how quickly does that data get presented to individual countries to have their uh, regulator and their payers start to work through it. And so inevitably, the first is the FDA in the US typically. And that's because, again, they have a, a fairly rapid process. They, it's a big country. They tend to spend dollars. And so that's the first place people go. Often next might be European, UK, Canadian approvals which all sort of happen at their own pace. And so, you know, we may be frequently one of the first handful out of the bag, but, you know, our process may not be one of the quickest. And so that can certainly take time for us to see results. Now, I think it's worthwhile. We might as well walk through a couple of examples and kind of see uh, how this looks to provide some of the context here about what we do. So here's an older example. And again, these are data that were published in the early 2000s. And the study uh, that's being presented is the initial study looking at adding rituximab to CHOP for patients with diffuse large cell lymphoma. And so this was a slam dunk as a clinical trial in that there was about a 15% improvement in overall survival when the data were presented with longer follow-up, though that doesn't matter for this. That was also demonstrated. But the difficulty here is this was a study that was done in patients above the age of 60. And so what ended up happening is these data were presented, a paper was published, uh, the first province to provide funding for this was actually in British Columbia. And then, you know, eventually after that, other provinces choose to, chose to fund it. The thing that was quite challenging here is that uh, BC actually took a very smart position and said the trial was done in patients above the age of 60. It wasn't particularly an expensive drug. And the idea was, if this was a benefit in a 60-year-old, it's probably going to be a benefit in a 59-year-old. And so while many other countries around the world and certainly other provinces had to wait for that additional study to make this available for patients under the age of 60, uh, at least in British Columbia, that happened very quickly. And uh, you know, I, I was in my training, left Vancouver, came to Toronto, and then had to suddenly work in an environment where one group of patients above the age of 60 could get this life-changing drug. And if you were 59, let alone if you were 39, it wasn't going to be feasible until the data were supporting it. Another example, and this is certainly much more current, this is polituzumab, and this might be the next drug as part of primary treatment in diffuse large cell lymphoma. These data were actually presented at the American Society of Hematology meeting back in December. So this is actually very, very fresh. And what you see here is that there is no survival advantage. So I'm not showing you that curve just from a space standpoint, but what you see here is that staying in remission, what we call progression-free survival is better, but the difference here isn't anything like 15%. As you can see here, the difference is 6.5%. And so the question that's gonna have to be dealt with, these data are available, is should this change practice? I think many of us believe that this is a step forward. This is the first clinical trial that's uh, improved frontline DLBCL with a new drug in 20 years since rituximab. And, and, and this drug is making its way through the process now. But the, the, the main question from a payer perspective is going to be how much does the drug cost in relationship to the 6.5% benefit? And is that going to be worthwhile for each province as we move forward? Another example here is brentuximab, and again, this is another novel therapy that's uh, now been approved in different circumstances in classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I'm going to highlight a couple of different points here. So on the left is the original study that looked at patients just post-autologous stem cell transplant, uh, 
who had progressive disease and needed new treatment. This drug was funded on the fact that the response rate was actually about 70%. The progression-free survival, as you can see here, actually doesn't look that good for Hodgkin's lymphoma at about six months. But this drug was approved fairly quickly because there was nothing else for this patient population at the time. The bottom panel here looks at post-transplant brentuximab as maintenance. And so this shows a big effect in terms of progression-free survival, but there's no difference in overall survival. The drug was ultimately funded for this indication in Canada. And what we now see is there's still no overall survival advantage, but that benefit still maintains at five years. And what we now know is in the patients that received BV, they were more likely to be cured. And so PFS here as an endpoint ends up being a very important thing for us. Lastly, on the right is the frontline trial looking at the addition of brentuximab to AVD. And what you can also see is again, an improvement, but where the results look so good in terms of overall survival, it really leads to the question of, you know, are we accomplishing much there's a small benefit in terms of overall survival. How much money is one paying for it? Again, this drug was already improved without the overall survival advantage. But the interesting thing here is that from a funding standpoint, not all of the patients that were in the initial population of the, of the study are actually have it available in Canada. Currently, it's only available for stage four patients, but this was approved for both stage three and stage four patients. Here's another example of a drug that never got approved in Canada. And so this is lenalidomide, again, an oral drug that looks very active in patients with follicular lymphoma, as an example, when it's combined with rituximab. Rituximab as a monotherapy has been available for follicular lymphoma patients in the relapse refractory setting in Canada for over 20 years. The frontline study, which you can see on the right, didn't show that rituximab and lenalidomide was better than rituximab and traditional chemotherapy. And so that wasn't funded here, but this would be a treatment that would be available in the US uh, despite not actually looking better. And certainly here's an example with a brutinib, just to kind of show you here, the, the idea that there was a randomized trial of a brutinib versus an older treatment called ofatumumab on the left, big difference in outcome in terms of progression-free and overall survival. And what you can see on the right panels are, you know, firstly, looking at higher risk, marginal zone lymphoma, again, a single arm trial, very difficult to do trials that are randomized in that setting, did not lead to approval. And whereas on the right, you can see in Waldenstrom's, again, a really good trial looking at a brutinib rituximab showing superiority over rituximab monotherapy, but that's not a treatment we tend to use very frequently in Canada because rituximab is more effective with chemo. And that makes it difficult when you're trying to apply this data into our environment from a funding standpoint. One of the biggest challenges right now uh, is looking at CAR T-cell therapy because this is a highly expensive therapy in the range of about a half million dollars. And the point I wanted to make with this slide is it's been taking a long time to bring this treatment uh, you know, to Canadians across the country. Certain provinces have this available. We're lucky in Ontario where I practice. This has been available for a few years now for diffuse large cell lymphoma. But again, last year we saw data that compared to stem cell transplants, CAR T cell therapy looks, looks better. We wanna have this available and we're still waiting. And unfortunately in mantle cell lymphoma, We've been waiting now for a couple of years because the data has been out there and this is funded and available in the US and in Europe. The next class of drugs that's gonna be coming are bispecific antibodies. They look very, very promising in follicular and diffuse large cell lymphoma in the relapse refractory setting. We're starting to see approvals coming around the world, this time firstly in the EU. When may these drugs come in Canada? I think that's gonna be a big question for us because this is a promising off the shelf treatment for us moving forward. Lastly, just a couple of other quick considerations in my last couple of minutes. Access is not just about drug costs, it's also about where can you get the drugs? And we know that complexity of treatment may limit the use of certain treatments to very specialized centers. So transplant centers can do transplant, centers that aren't set up to do that can't. There are certain centers out in the community that may have difficulty with complex therapies. Cellular therapy currently in Canada isn't being done even at all transplant centers because of the complexity around the number of supports that you need to do it. Clinical trials are a way to access treatment, 
But in order to get those treatments, you need to fit the clinical criteria that go into the study population. So it's not a way for all patients to access treatment and ultimately is not the right way to access treatment if we already know it's effective because that should be available. But if it's a clinical trial that's designed to generate access, then that might be a good choice. What other options are there? Unfortunately, leaving the country is an option, but it may be difficult and challenging both from a cost and practicality standpoint. And there may be additional costs that you don't think about, even if a clinical trial may be available. Just lastly, private payer or support from pharma may be an option as well. There's a lot of challenges there based on the drugs, certainly a lot easier if it's an oral treatment compared to IV. If it's IV, it can be very problematic because hospitals may not be able to administer that uh, if it's a if it's a drug that's not being provided through the standard healthcare system. So it does feel like there are gaps out there and you might've gotten the sense that there might be the opportunity for the perception of a two-tier system. And that really is true because financial independence can provide a lot of flexibility here. And so that is unfair, but that is unfortunately a reality. And in some, in some countries, it's a much more formalized reality, whether that's Australia, the UK, other places in Europe, or certainly the US. So to summarize, this is a highly challenging area. There are multiple stakeholders. Patients and clinicians are frequently caught in the middle with some of these issues. The complexity here, you can't avoid cost. It can't be too slow. And you know this quick dive into this area, I think really highlights some of the challenges and the need to, to try and make this a better process so we can speed things up. And so with that, uh, I'm just going to stop my share and uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to spend this time and give you some thoughts on this topic. Awesome. Thank you, John, for that excellent presentation. It certainly made me question a lot of different things, um, but we have a few questions from our patients. Um, one says, do you know of any funding programs that are available federally and provincially to offset travel costs or medical costs that aren't covered by public health insurance? Uh, I mean, so I think the specifics are going to vary there substantially based on the province that you work in, as well as the type of treatment. You know, this, the first example that leaps to mind, travel may be important around CAR-T, and the CAR-T companies have provided funding for standard of care to help with some of those things. I have to admit, the government in general does not tend to provide a lot around transit costs, unfortunately, certainly in Ontario. I'm not sure if that's true uh, in other provinces. Okay, good to know. Um, another one has, um, why does each province have different regulatory processes um, to review Health Canada approved lymphoma drugs? Uh, well, I guess the easy answer is to say that uh, healthcare is ultimately in Canada a provincial decision. And so that's the way that the people that designed the country in healthcare designed it to be. So is that ultimately what people want? It seems like we like the idea of trying to make this easy and level playing field for the country, but I think we all understand that every, every province appears to be unique and uh, that has pros and cons. Yeah, that, that's very fair. Um, so another one was on specifically CAR-Ts and I guess it's about the accessing. So they say, I understand CAR-T is only available in certain provinces. If I don't live in that province, does that mean I'm ineligible for it? Uh, so there's a couple of layers to that question. So, you know, firstly, um, currently the only funding for CAR, uh, for CAR T-cell therapy is in diffuse large cell lymphoma in Canada. That's the only approved indication. And it's only approved as a third line therapy or beyond. And so um, most provinces have very clear criteria about what is required. And if someone lives in a province that currently doesn't have uh, standard of care funding to have it done in that province, there are relationships with CAR-T programs in other provinces to facilitate that. Um, so again, the details there, the individual province may have specific criteria, and there's often some discussion with the province where it's being done, you know, whether that's Quebec, Ontario, whatever, as an example, about uh, the specifics of the eligibility, which tend to reflect the way the clinical trials were done for CAR-T. Okay, that's a great question. That's a great answer. Um, and I think we're just going to have time for one more question. Um, in general, how can patients advocate for a certain treatment or a certain treatment that is for their lymphoma? Is there any ways that they can do that? Well, I guess there's, again, two, two other, two, two sub-questions in there. So firstly, uh, 
uh, specific patients for specific treatments for themselves, I would say that's a very challenging situation because that often means the decision needs to happen immediately because a patient needs a treatment. And so I would say the likelihood of advocating successfully for that is, is not going to be good. And it may be because you're asking for a treatment that uh, is available in a clinical trial in another center or another country that might be uh, not feasible because you can't open clinical trials everywhere. If it's a funded available drug in another province, it may not be funded in this province because it was decided that it wasn't effective and not to be used in this setting. Um, ultimately, it may not be a drug, as I've, as I've highlighted it earlier, that may not be available in Canada yet. And so there may be some opportunity there. I mean, discussing it with the treating a clinician is probably the best way to go. The second point really quickly what can you do in an, in an environment where it doesn't need to happen immediately? I think that's where we ultimately need to push our politicians because it is the politicians that make the decisions. And I'll remind you that the only group in Canada that is really an advocacy group for those types of issues, you should be very familiar with because that's Lymphoma Canada. Awesome, thank you, John, for that advice and certainly for promoting Lymphoma Canada. Um, and so thank you everyone for joining and please stay tuned for the breakout sessions um, that are going to happen in just a few minutes. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.